I won't get upset, but okay, but say that. Yeah. Um, so I, I heard a few uh, recently, I heard a shout out here from the Hashem Arav, that he was talking about the whole matzah with the, with the hostages, and he, and, he, and he wanted to say that, based on the mission of that, aim of Rikin is a shvuli with me keeping the whole So just that would be a shout. It might be questionable about this whole the IDF, the whole what they're doing. Being a biyach shvuli might be it might be a question, and even if you want to say that it's that it's mutter, the whole the fact that they publicize it, that they make a whole big deal about it, because then uh, the Hamas themselves they said that now they're gonna watch the other captives more closely. So maybe, yeah. maybe that might be a question. And the second part of my question is is stavozoi uh, stavozoi. We see how many people are making a big deal about the hostages, like they put up signs, they make protests, is and. Is this is this something that we should partake in? Because because like, then obviously Hamas they 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 see how much we we care about our captives and they raise the price and is is this something that we should be partaking in? Yeah, yeah. So uh, w- this is interesting because your question brings up a halacha in the Mishnah that is not spoken about. There are two halachas in the Mishnah that are relevant here, and there's a lot of speaking about one of the halachas and there's very little speaking about the other halacha. The first halacha, this is in the fourth parak of Gittin, maybe you actually uh, learned it. Uh, that means we do not ransom, we do not pay a ransom for hostages more than their economic value as a slave. We don't pay what is called excessive concessions for hostages. And uh, the Gemara gives two reasons, but the reason that's Abkapasun la halacha is because you're encouraging the enemy to take more and more people if they can get a million dollars for a hostage. That's, that's the first halacha. Don't pay what is called excessive ransom. There's another halacha that people are not talking about so much that actually says we don't try to rescue hostages by rescue mis- uh, uh, missions because we would be endangering the people that remain behind. So, so if you think about this, all aspects of this raise potentially halachic problems. We have hostages. On one hand, there's a tremendous mitzvah called pigeon shvuyin, redeeming captives. You even sell a Sefer Torah for pigeon shvuyin. And then generally, pikuach nefesh, your mechalo Shabbos, to save a life. So you would think, Papashtus, we do whatever we can to rescue the civilian. But the problem is, the Gemara says, if you give in to those demands, you're going to be endangering future people because if Hamas knows that for every hostage they can get uh, 100 prisoners, they'll take more and more and more and more. So you think you're saving 100 lives now, but maybe you're saving 100 lives now by being masakain 1,000 people in the future. And when it's not just money, but you're actually releasing terrorists, you have another Indian that it's not only you're encouraging future hostage takings, but you're mamish introducing people that are right schim, they're back into the population. So, Aliba Diemis, there's a very, very serious question. Now, again, emotionally, this is extremely difficult. Uh, if you are a prime minister, how do you look a parent in the eye and say, I'm sorry, we have an enemy, we have to get rid of Hamas, Hamas is going to endanger our population. If that means we have to bomb them and not give in to, the, uh, to get the hostages, so be it. That's extremely difficult. But halachically, there is at least a shaila. Are we allowed to give in to prisoner exchange programs? Isn't that excessive ransoms that are encouraging hostage taking? and being masake in the future population. Now, even what was Han Baruch Hashem this past week, just was it yesterday, two days ago, in which there was a daring rescue mission that uh, Baruch Hashem was zeichet to get two people. So uh, this was a military mission, but the mission itself says even that may be a problem because you're endangering the people that remain, the tighter security, they might decide to kill, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So Lamaisa, what the mission is basically saying is, in terms of strategy, that you can't just look at the immediate situation. Uh, I have people with Sakana, I gotta rescue them. You have to look at the long-term tight size, the long-term consequences of the short-term decision. So Lamai said these are very, very serious halachic questions, and they're actually serious military questions. They're serious ethical questions uh, generally. 
Now, uh, interestingly enough, this is not the first time uh, the Paiskim in Eretz Yisrael had to deal with this. This is an issue that's been going on for many, many years. As you might expect, there was a big, there's a big machlekes of Paiskim. Ravaji Yosef, well, let's go back to the most famous one. Gilad Shalit is probably the most famous hostage exchange in which he was in captivity for many years, what, five, five years, more than five years, and they finally released him in exchange for a thousand terrorists, among whom was Sinwar, who was the mastermind of October 7th. So it's amazing. You save Gilad Shalit, and then you release the guy that's going to, you know, mastermind the murder of 1,200 civilians, plus all of the hostages, etc. I mean, that itself is an example of how dangerous this was. Ravaji Yosef basically did moderate. And his understanding, it's hard to go into all the background, I, I have recorded shiurim on this, was, ain't suffolk vaisi midei vadai, meaning to say you got to look at the vadai and ignore the suffolk. Right now we have people besakana, we got to rescue them. What's going to happen in the future? That's not for us to look at. I, the Mishnah seems to say you look at it, so he says the Mishnah, it's a big daichik, is only talking about a case where actual lives are not in danger. The Shavuyan are being held for money and not for Sakhanis Nefashis. Okay. So Rav Avadja matured it. We know Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, not, not with Gilad Shalit, but in an earlier case, actually said it's usher. He says, in time of Milchama, Rav Yaakov said, there is no way that you can give any type of chizuk to the enemy. And Rav Yaakov said, this is an interesting way of looking at it, the same way that soldiers must fight the enemy, even though that endangers their lives, because the ultimate goal is to destroy this enemy, so too, chas v'shalom, the chatufim are involuntarily participating in this war. They didn't choose it. And you can't allow anything to be done that will compromise the military objective, even if it, even if it puts them in danger, because they become chayolim, who are obligated to risk their lives for the purpose of the greater military objective. So Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky actually held it was usher to make any type of deal with terrorists. Now, it may be, according to that Svara, even the rescue attempts might be usher for the same reason. He didn't clearly say that. But he did say you don't make terrorist deals because we look at chatufim as chayolim, involuntary chayolim, who must, in a sense, give their lives for the military effort. Uh, according to that, you know, people talk about the permissibility of Israeli bombing with civilian casualties. According to Rav Yaakov, not only are we permitted to bomb if we're going to get civilian Arab casualties, but God forbid, even if it would mean we would kill the Jews in captivity, he held that was part of our obligation. I'm not here to Paskin. This is a very, very painful question, and one cannot simply be insensitive to the feelings of families. But I'll just mention, you know, all of you remember Jonathan Pollard, who was uh, in prison for 30 years, and now he lives in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, he's not a posik, so obviously what he says is not the psak halach in any way, but he is very open. He says that it is absolutely wrong to have any publicity about hostages, and he actually said families should be ordered not to talk about it, and if they insist on demanding release, they should be thrown in jail. Now, this is what he said. That's a very extreme position, but he says it is a state of national emergency, and Israel cannot allow itself to be swayed away from this military objective, because if they don't get rid of this enemy, this enemy will come back with greater force and destroy more and more people. So what looks like Rachmanus in the short term turns out to be tremendous achsarius in the long term. Again, I want to emphasize, because I don't want to, want to get into arguments through email or whatever it is, I, I'm just articulating a position, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky's position. Remember, Rav Ovadja took the opposite position. Rav Ovadja Yosef, and he says Rav Yashav agreed with him, although we don't have a tshuva from him. Rav Ovadja Yosef, and he says Rav Yashav took the position that the pikuach nefesh of hostages 
overrides the military objective. So you see, it's a very, very complicated issue in which G'dayle HaPaiskim Mamish were in, in great, in great uh, disagreement. So my answer is you have to ask your local Orthodox rabbi as to what your own position should be. Uh, it's very, very difficult, and um, it's really tearing apart uh, Israel right now. This is one of the most emotionally difficult issues. You know, Hamas is proposing, you know, all of these hostage releases. If you just have a ceasefire for, you know, six months, whatever it is. Well, okay, that's great to have hostages back. Baruch Hashem. But giving Hamas six months, do you realize what that is? That essentially undoes everything that was hopefully accomplished since October 7. Right? So you've got to be very careful. You can't allow emotion to override the logic of what needs to be done in this tragic situation. So this is one of the, well, one of many reasons that I'm happy I'm not in the political system, that I don't have to make those decisions. They are halakhically complicated. They are emotionally difficult. They are politically explosive. Very, very, very hard decisions. Yeah? From your descendant, what's considered tzedakah nowadays? To whom and what amount? On that point, I once saw something in Avos Derbe Nassam that renders tzedakah equivalent to karbanos. Philosophically, what's the shot? Yeah, so the question was asking, what is tzedakah today? I'm not sure I, I fully understand. Uh, let me just mention in a general way. There is, of course, a mitzvah of tzedakah. And let me digress for a moment about the Hebrew word tzedakah. This is very, very, very interesting. You know, tzedakah is normally translated as charity. And yet, quite literally, tzedakah is related to the word tzedek, which means justice. So you see the difference here. Charity implies I'm the owner of my money, but I'm a nice guy, and you know I give my money to you. Tzedek implies justice. Hashem gave me my resources, so I should share them with the people who need it. Meaning, the Ani's claim to tzedakah is not because I have pity on him, but because uh, he is entitled. This is what the Torah says, why Hashem gave me wealth. Hashem gave me wealth, so I will share it. Uh, and that, so, so it's very important to know that tzedakah does not mean charity. It's much more closer to the idea of justice. Now, in the laws of tzedakah, there is an interesting principle that says you have to give a poor person or a needy person de machsarai asher yachsarlai, whatever it is that he's missing. So the Gemara says an example. If you had a guy who used to be very wealthy and he would have servants that would attend to him, and now he's just middle class, living like everybody else, he is entitled to tzedakah, to be able to live in the manner to which he was accustomed. Because for him, this is a psychological lack. Now, enochinami, when you're talking about priority, who do I prioritize? The guy that needs a valet or the guy that needs food on the table? For shtetzach, you will prioritize a basic need over what you might call a luxury need. But even a luxury need can qualify as tzedakah if that's the situation that the person found themselves in. So as a result, it would appear that in Hilchai tzedakah, we're not dealing with bread and water people. We're not dealing with people, oh, I, they don't have bread and water, so I have to give them bread and water. We're talking about people who may have, first of all, Bismanazah, there's Kemat, no one that's really poor in the classical sense of being poor. Maybe in Africa you have such people, but you know, as poor as people are in Eretz Israel, uh, there's nobody who will die of starvation because they don't have bread. So tzedakah is not necessarily subsistence. It's kolel, the things that a normal person has as part of a middle-class life. And therefore, tzedakah can be given even to people that you would not look at as totally destitute in the classical sense. Um, that's one thing. Now, the idea of tzedakah compared to korbanos uh, basically is based on the, the simplest idea is that just as sacrifices are atonement for sin, tzedakah is a great, great kapara for Averas. It's a tremendous thing. Chazal say, we say it in davening, tshuva tfilu tzedakah, mavirin esraya hagzeira. 
It is tshuva, repentance, tefillah, prayer, tzedakah. They take away the evil decree. They change the midah sadin to the midah of rachamim. Uh, it says in Mishle, famous pasuk, tzedakah tatsil mimaves. Tzedakah saves a person from death. So the simple idea of tzedakah connected to korbanos is both of them are great mechaprei avain. Both of them are mechaper avain, tremendously. But it's also the case that a korban is a sacrifice. You're taking something that you own, that you invested in, and you're giving it to Hashem. So the remez is, when I take my money, my damim, and I give it to an ani, in a sense, I'm giving it to Hashem. I'm doing Hashem's work. Hashem takes care of the aniim through my chiyuvim of tzedakah. So therefore, I'm giving a korban to Hashem by my giving tzedakah. Now, the Balatanya writes that the word for damim, money, also means blood. Damim tarti mashma. It's mashma blood, mean, meaning... He, he, you can see he's describing how hard it is to make a living sometimes, that when people make a living and they earn whatever amount of money they make, it's like they put their blood into it. They put their effort, their kishkas, their muscles, their effort, the hours of not sleeping sometimes. So the money represents what they gave their life for. Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but Lamaisa, it's often that case. So when they take what they gave their blood for, damim, and they give it to tzedakah. So once again, it's kind of they're giving some of their life to the ani. Now remember that the Ramban writes that that's also the vision of korbanos. What is a korban? That I realize that the death of the animal should be happening to me in a sense when the animal dies, I should feel it's my symbolic death. And there but for the grace of God goes me. And therefore it's also a miser my nefesh via the korban. So both of them involve a misiras, misiras nefesh. That's the idea of korban. Yeah. Um, let me explain because the origin of machlokas, um, whether it's something that's like desired or desirable, like with regard to like elu v'elu, and also um, how, how exactly Judaism worked, like in the times of the Tanam and Amaran, when there were such like disparate opinions, whether that was like, it was like, not like, not like compared to now when we have a Shulchan Aruch and like we have some type of a normative Aruch. Yeah, the, these are interesting questions about the nature of the Torah Shabal Peh, the nature of Machlokas, how did things exist in the olden days, however you define the olden days. So let me explain one thing. There are two things you need, you need to know. First, people ask a very simple question. If we believe that Hashem gave not just the written Torah, but Hashem gave the oral interpretations of the Torah to Moshe, and they were handed down generation to generation orally until such time that they were in danger of being forgotten, and they were set down in the Mishnah and the Gemara, then how is it possible for there to ever be a machlokas? We say one man the Omer says kosher, one says treif, one says chayav, one says putter, one says tohor, one says tame. What did Hashem say? If Hashem said everything to Moshe, then somebody got it wrong. And if somebody got it wrong, that means there are errors in transmission. If there are errors in transmission, then number one, that undermines the veracity of the whole system. And number two, it contradicts the klal of the Gemara, Eilu v'Eilu, Divrei Elohim Chaim, they're both right. If Hashem said A, then B is not right. If Hashem said B, then A is not right. So how do you reconcile, that's a really fundamental question, how do you reconcile the divine origin of the Tarish Abel Peh with the numerous machloksim that appear from the first page of Shas to the last page of Shas? Uh, there's actually one parak in Shas where the Mishnayis don't have a machlokas. But that's only in the Mishnayis, not in the Gemara. And that's the parak, Ezeu Mekaymen Shel Zvachim, that is in Karbonus every day. If you look, that's the only parak of Mishnayis in Shas that doesn't have any machlokas. Perhaps that's why we say it every day. Besides, it has the Karbonus, you know, have Shalom al Yisrael. But everything is machlokas. So the answer to that is, I mean, there are deeper ways of expressing it, but the simplest answer is that people make a big mistake when they assume 
that what Hashem gave to Moshe was a definitive answer to every possible question. When we say the Torah Shabbat is divine, we mean Hashem gave Moshe the basic yesedes, the basic principles from which all halacha can be derived, whether it's the Yud Gimel Midas of interpretation or the general principles. And then it was left to the Chachamim of every generation, even today, to use those principles to apply them to new situations. So Hashem didn't give Moshe a psak about microwave ovens on Shabbos or a surrogate motherhood, but Hashem gave Moshe the klolim out of which the Chachamim can extrapolate. Now the Rambam writes in the Hakdama to Perish Mishnayis that if you have two great Chachamim with identical first principles, they will differ as to how to apply those principles to a given situation. So Eilu Eilu Divrei Eilu Kim Chaim is what Hashem is basically saying as long as the Chachamim are Ra'oi to Paskin, that's a big question I'm glassing over, but as long as they are authorized to Paskin, and as long as they follow the rules, and as long as they utilize the Klalim of Tarisha Balpeh, Hashem says whatever conclusion they come up with will be blessed with HaKadosh Baruch Hu's MS, even if Hashem would come to a different answer. That's the story of Loba Shemayimi. Objectively, they're wrong, but operationally and behaviorally, it's fine. It's a very deep idea that there are two levels of truth. There is an objective heavenly truth, but then there is the Ratzon Hashem, that the truth of how to apply halacha should be established by human intelligence based on the Klalim of Torah Shabbat. So, for example, I mean, I say this a million times, so forgive me if you've heard it a million times. People often have this view that every word of the Gemara was given to Moshe Rabbeinu, and the whole Shas was handed down until Ravina and Ravashi wrote it down. Now, think about how impossible that would be. I mean, Ravina, Ravashi, Abaya, Rabbi, these are people. They lived at a certain time. Are you telling me that there was a script? First of all, it wasn't even a script. It would be an oral. There was an oral script as to what Abaya is going to say? Like what? So, and who gave him his lines? <laughs> Obviously, when Abaya and Rava are debating, they're doing, of course, they're infinitely higher than us, but they're doing the same thing you're doing. They're using their swara to try to figure things out. Yeah, of course, they're infinitely greater than us. But the process is the same process. So the, the concept that the Gomorrah word for word was handed down is absurd because it happened when it happened. But we mean the Yisodos of the Torah Shabbat go all the way back. Okay, now, so where does Machlokas come from? So it's interesting that originally there was always Machlokas. There was always Machlokas. But for a very long time, Machlokas got resolved because when you had a Sanhedrin of 71, they would discuss the application of the Halacha to given situations. And they would decide things by a majority vote. If 36 chachamim say a certain way, and 35 dis differ, under the rule of acharei rabbim lahatais, the halacha became the 36. And at that point, it's usher diaraisa for the 35 to pask in their own way. So machlokas didn't start at a certain point, Machlokas is inherent in human beings, as great as they are, trying to apply halacha to different situations. But for hundreds and hundreds of years, Machlokas was resolved definitively by a Sanhedrin. Now, it's interesting that we did have a Sanhedrin for a very long time. We had a Sanhedrin for the period of the Tanakh. We had the Sanhedrin for the whole period of the Bayashani, the period of the Mishnah, and we even had a Sanhedrin towards the beginning of the Amoran. So you'll ask me, well, if that's the case, then why was there Mach I mean, Beishel and Beishama? There was a Sanhedrin then. So you cannot just give the answer that Machlokas originated when there wasn't a Sanhedrin, because that's not Emes either. Machlokas did originate even when there was a Sanhedrin and around the time of Hillel and Shammai. And what that basically meant, the Gemara says, is 
that there were times in which the Chachamim were so divided that they didn't want to decide by a majority vote because they felt they didn't have the clarity to be machria. In other words, this is called, a modern legal term, this is called abstention. For example, the Havdil, I don't mean to compare it. The Supreme Court of the United States may sometimes decide not to take a certain case because they feel that the different courts are divided and you have to let them fight it out a little bit and we're not ready to be machria. In the time of Hillel and Shammai, or at least the Talmidim of Hillel and Shammai, the Sanhedrin began to stop taking a lot of cases, which meant there was what you might call a decentralization of the halachic process. In one city, they followed this psak. In another city, they followed another psak. And even though the Sanhedrin could have been machria, what the halacha was, they were machlet, they weren't going to be machria. The, the technical language is, they were not made laminion. They didn't want to make a vote. They could have made a vote, but if you don't have a consensus, you, know, you, you don't want to force it. So for the, most of the period of the Tanoim and the Amorayim, certainly, there was, in a sense, a decentralization of halacha in which different opinions were allowed to coexist. The Gemara says, for example, in the, that Midrabana, you're not allowed to eat uh, chicken and milk. Right? Doraisa, it's only meat and milk. Midrabana, Basar Aif Bechalav is, I'm sorry, Doraisa, Basar Aif Bechalav is Mutter, Midrabana, it's Asar. But it mentions Rav Yaisi disagreed with that Din Drabana, and it says, in the city of Rav Yaisi, they, ac they actually ate chicken and milk. Decentralization. There was no definitive psak. So as a re now, Kal Vachimer, after the Sanhedrin, you had that as well, because you didn't even have a body that could give you definitive psaq. What there, and therefore, that is actually the basis historically of how different minhagim developed, different shitos developed, because when you didn't have a Sanhedrin, Befrat, many interpreted in different ways. One of the big mysteries, and again, this is such a, a long and important topic that you know, it would need hours and hours and hours to go over this, is what makes, in fact, you have all of these problems, what makes the Gemara binding? Now, it's true that the Gemara often does not give you the halacha anyway, but we do consider the Gemara binding, meaning Ga'inim cannot argue on the Gemara, Rishainim cannot argue on the Gemara, etc. Why is that? Because if by the time of Ravina and Ravashi there was no Sanhedrin, then the views that are in the Gemara are simply views of individual Amairaim. Why can't I argue? Why can't I argue with the Tana? Why can't I argue with an Amora? Like, what creates any authority at all? The only authority the Torah recognizes as final definitive halachic resolution is the Sanhedrin of 71. Yeah, if the Sanhedrin of 71 paskins something, it is forbidden for me to argue with them and indeed, if I'm a Zakein Mamre, if I'm an elder who rebels against us, I could be Chayiv Misa for that. But anything beyond that, I mean, why, why is it in the Gemara is it so pushed that an Amora cannot argue with the Tana? And why is it so pushed, even more pushed, that I can't argue with the Gemara? What if I think the Gemara got it wrong? I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but you know, what binds me to the Gemara? The, you know, as you know, it, it seems to be so obvious to us, but you know, the actual reasons are very murky. The Rambam says in the Mishnah Torah that the binding nature of the Talmud Bavli is Klal Yisrael was Makabil it. Number one, there are two questions with that. First of all, what do you mean Klal Yisrael was Makabil it? Not all of Klal Yisrael was Makabil it. The Karam were not Makabil it. So what are you going to say? Well, they don't count. You know, they don't count. Okay, so you're... you're <laughs> the, in other words, Klau Yisrael accepted it, but the only people who are Klau Yisrael are the people who accept it. I mean, you get into problems there. That's called um, the no true Scotchman, uh, <laughs> whatever it's, okay. Uh, that's one problem. But the other problem is, Mehechi Tesi, who says, because Klau Yisrael was Makabel it, that we're going to be bound. The Rambam's Chiddush seems to be, it's a big Chiddush, that the acceptance by the Jewish people 
is equivalent to a decision of the Sanhedrin. What's the makar? Maybe the makar is matan Torah itself. It, it's so fascinating. If you ask, why do I have to keep the Torah? So we intuitively think, well, God commanded us. But you know, that's not quite how it was. We have to keep the Torah because we accepted the Torah. Isn't that, isn't that an interesting idea? We're bound by the Torah because we accepted it. And even though I wasn't there, the Pashtas, but the nation accepted it. A fascinating idea that Klal Yisrael is bound by what it's Makabah. And the Rambam applies that paradigm to the Gemara, other things. Big Kiddush. But then, when you have questions about how to interpret the Gemara, you'll be back to Machlokas again. You see? So, when the Rambam wrote his work, the Rif and the Rambam and the Shulchan Arach, all of them attempted, there was so much Machlokas, they thought it was time to kind of bring people together. Now, the Rambam's work, nobody had to accept. What authority does the Rambam's work have? What authority does the Shulchan Aruch have? It's not a Sanhedrin. Once again, the authority of the Shulchan Aruch is only because people were Makabalit. But they weren't Makabalit in the same sense as the Talmud Bavli, because Ashkenazim have the Ramah and everything else. So it, it's complicated. Uh, you know, but basically, the, the origin of Machlokas is Hashem's desire that the application of the Klolem of Teresha Balpeh be uh, emerge from human intellect and analysis. And when there's no Sanhedrin, or the Sanhedrin didn't want to be Machria, that would, by definition, lead to decentralized uh, decision-making. Uh, now, is that good or bad? So this is interesting. Obviously, Rambam, Rav Yasef Cairo, said it was bad. We got to minimize machlokas. We got to try to create unity. That's, that was the impetus for those books. On the other hand, people don't realize there's a whole history of great, great gedolim who were against the whole Shulchan Aruch idea. Among them, Maharal, who lived around the same time. Among them, the Marshal. And they argued we don't need a book to tell us what the halacha is. A rav and a posek should go back to the Gemara, go to the sugyas, learn the Rishonim, learn all the different commentaries, and then paskin for his congregation, his community, what the halacha is. And if there are going to be different shitos in different places, kachi darka shel Torah, that is the beauty of the Torah that we will have different ways of understanding the will of God. So the Shulchan Aruch was not universally, I mean, everyone was mocker of Yosef Cairo as a great guttle, that's not, that's not the question. But the project of what you call codification uh, was not uh, universally uh, accepted. Uh, in fact, it was thought to be a rida. It was thought to be a, a diminution in Kavod HaTayra. The cover that Taira is that I should be able to go back to the Gemaras and be able to understand the sugya uh, much, much uh, better. I would also say, too, that to a large degree, codification was a failure in terms of its stated objective. Let's go back to the Rambam. Right? The Rambam wrote the Mishnah Taira, and the Rambam made the claim. Why did he call the Mishnah Taira the second Taira? The Rambam says, all you need in your library are two books. Have a Chumash, for Torah Shebechsav, and have my book for Torah Shebaopeh. I give you the rule, I give you the answer. You don't need Gemara, you don't need to learn all these different opinions. The Ravid accuses the Rambam of telling people not to learn Gemara. Okay, the Rambam said he didn't mean that exactly. But the Rambam says, let's not have machloksim anymore. Well, let me ask you this. You know, the Rambam's book is one of the greatest Svarm ever written. But did the Rambam achieve unity? Absolutely not. So this, this may not, again, it's not covered. I have to be very careful. In terms of the Rambam's stated objective, stated objective, the Mishnah Torah is a failure. It is an enormous success in terms of teaching me the Torah, explaining the Torah, etc. But in terms of unity and lack of machlokas, he certainly didn't achieve that. Shulchan Aruch, 
Do you know Rav Yosef Kaira wrote the Shulchan Aruch a few hundred years after the Rambam to be, it was really a kitzer of the Beis Yosef on the Torah. And it was written that you could chazer the whole Shulchan Aruch, not kitzer Shulchan Aruch, in 30 days. The Shulchan Aruch was divided into 30 day, uh, daily se uh, sections for 30 days. Quick review, one opinion, get the answer, no questions. Well, now a Shulchan Aruch is whatever it is, uh, 10 volumes filled with mephorshim, filled with qualifications, filled with machloksim. So what happens is this. It's like every time we try to put halacha in a box, it's getting too complicated. Let's just put it in a box. It keeps on exploding. And in a way, that's a reflection of the infinity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Torah and God are one. God is infinite. You can't put God in a box. You can't put halacha in a box. Every time you try to simplify it, it gets a momentum that breaks out of the box. That happened to the Rambam. That happened to the Shulchan Aruch. It still goes on even today. So when you ask me, is machlokas desirable or not desirable? So the short answer is the Gemara seems to indicate that the origin of machlokas came from a lack of clarity. Talmidim of Hillel v'Shamay, Shloshimshu called Sorchem. So in a sense, machlokas was an undesirable effect of people not being on the madrega that they were. And yet, in Sifri Chasidus, we see there's also the positive benefit of machlokas, in which every side of Hashem's infinity finds its reflection and finds its expression. Yeah? If, if there was no machlokas, then the whole Torah Shabbat, that would be like a kitzur shofar, right? How, That's correct. What would Talmud Torah even be? That's correct. That's correct. What would Talmud Torah be? Uh, if so, so, so the Rambam actually suggests. The Rambam actually suggests. This is an amazing statement that nobody pays attention to. That the Rambam felt. Listen, I'm going to give you halacha psuka, and you're not going to have to go over shakavatarius because I'm going to give you the rule, and you can spend your time learning philosophy and metaphysics and the nature of God. Now. People ignore that, that passage. I mean, it seems to me that the Rambam is basically saying that ultimately the philosophy of Yediyah Sashem, I'm not really in the mood for another hate mail thing, but, but the philosophy <laughs> of, of Yediyah Sashem trumps uh, technically, technically learning Gemara. Now, Chaim Belajner would 1,000% disagree with that. But I think this is actually the position of the Rambam. The Rambam says, ideal Talmud Torah is, you know, you chazer, you review, the Torah Shabbat and the Torah Shabbat Peh, and you understand the reasons, and then you spend your time on the philosophy of God, uh, metaphysics and, and the like. That's what the Rabbim seems to say. Yeah. Yes. Um, how can we negate a lot of uh, one of the basic uh, principles, uh, crucial information of the oral code, uh, for example, a telephone game, uh, during the period between Moses uh, to the writing of the yeah, yeah, so, so this is a kind of an additional follow-up question on this. Everyone knows you played as children uh, the telephone game, which is a very, very funny game. I give you a message, you pass it down. By the time it gets to the 10th person, it has no shaykhs, no connection whatsoever. Uh, things get distorted. People only hear half of the message or whatever they misinterpret. So the question is, if you have a Torah Shabbat Peh that is passed down for hundreds and hundreds of years till it's finally written down in one form or the other, how can we guarantee at all that it is an accurate transmission of those earlier teachings? Maybe it got distorted uh, by telephone. Um, that, that, that is a very, very good question, and I'm not sure I can give you a definitive proof answer, but let me point out a few things. Point number one is that in the ancient world, the accurate transmission, I'm talking about even outside of Judaism, the accurate transmission of mass quantities of information was a much more common technique than now. Our memories have atrophied because now we have internet, we have ways, we have printed books. We don't need to remember a lot of stuff. In the olden days, they would pass down massive amounts of information. An example, a secular example, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are Homer's, huge poems. Uh, they say date from a time when Greece did not even have an alphabet. And it was La Havdel, Torah Shabal Peh, that was handed down. Even more recently, there are Native American tribes, American Indian tribes, 
that have these histories. And it takes like three weeks to recount the histories. And there are still some zakanim, I'm not sure now, elders who take three weeks of the year to kind of go over the histories. So you do have to know that it could very well be that the telephone phenomenon is more recent than you might think, that in the ancient world there was a strong propensity to be accurate in information. But another point is this. The point is, Torah Shabal Peh was not transmitted through a single channel. There were thousands and maybe tens of thousands of different receivers. So imagine, let's take even telephone. Imagine if you had a message that was conveyed to 10,000 people or a million people. And each of them created a line of transmission. And at the end of the transmission, all million of them come up with the same report. That would be a strong evidence of an absence of distortion, meaning the telephone thing is true when there's a single line of transmission, and then I compare the beginning and the end. But if I have multiple lines of transmission, and in those multiple lines of transmission, they all come up with the same story, and I don't know what was at the beginning, but I'm just using my assumption of telephone distortion, well, why would it be so that all of these people would distort it in the same way? There should have been different distortions. So the Rambam himself explains that the Torah Shabal Peh was transmitted in multiple channels over hundreds of years, and that itself was kind of a guarantee to its veracity. Now, as I indicated, Chazal do talk about the possibility of certain things being forgotten, and having to be restored, so we don't deny that, but the slippage was relatively small, meaning we're not claiming 100% accuracy, but we are claiming that the vast majority was preserved, and uh, as a result, uh, we assume that we have an accurate Torah Shabal Peh. Um, an interesting question is, how, how does that apply in later generations? You know, in the 19th century, the 1800s, many new manuscripts of Rishonim were discovered that were not available earlier. For example, the Me'iri. The Me'iri is one of the great Perushim on all of Shas, and the Me'iri is quoted in the Shita Mekubetzes and other places, but the Me'iri was lost. The, 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 the Swarm were not available. They started to be uncovered in the uh, 1800s, and uh, in, even, into the 20th, even into the 20th century. So the interesting question is that we discover books that were not available to Rav Yosef Karo, were not available to the Shach, were not available to Rabbi Kiva Eger or the Vilna Gaon. Should that cause us to re-examine halachic conclusions on the basis of new sources of information that were not available to the earlier generations? Do we say, oh, if the Gra would have seen the Me'iri, maybe he would have changed his mind, and therefore, you know. So this is a huge machlokas. Uh, the Chazanish famously took the position, almost a mystical idea, that if information was not available to the Masorah of Torah Shabal Peh, Hashem didn't want them to use that information, and therefore the Halacha is the Halacha, and it is not changed by new manuscripts. In fact, the Chazanish says, I don't even look at new manuscripts. Uh, because if they weren't part of the transmission of Torah Shabal Peh, we don't assume that Hashem wants us to use them now. I mean, you can use them for learning, but not for halakhic determination. Others say, hey, you got to look at the facts. I mean, if we have new facts, new Rishonim, the Beis Yosef was machria based on a majority as it was understood at that time. Now we have other numbers to add to the majority. So this is a, a very live machlokas. To what extent do we look at later sources to revisit earlier sources? But th that's really post-Talmudic. That's not referring to the composition of the Talmud itself. Yeah. Here's another sentence. What exactly is the Shekhinah? What does the concept of God's presence entail? And how does it rest on someone or something since God is already omnipresent? Yeah, so the question is, what is the Shekhinah? And what does it mean that God's presence rests uh, on anyone or anything uh, since Hashem is ever-present no matter what? And of course, uh, this is very, very relevant uh, to the Parsha of the week. Uh, this is the Parsha of building a Mishkan, 
building a dwelling place, a tabernacle for God. And what does the Pasuk say? V'yasu li mikdash, make for me a holy place. V'shachanti, so I will dwell. Shekhinah comes from that word. B'socham, in their midst. And everyone knows the famous interpretation. It doesn't say Hashem dwells in the Mishkan, but the Mishkan is a conduit for Hashem Shekhinah to dwell in our heart and in our soul. The real Mishkan of Hashem is in you. Right? The Beis HaMikdash is a tangible symbol of that. V'shachanti b'socham. So the question becomes, what does that mean? And now this creates a certain paradox in Judaism. Because on one hand, we say God is everywhere. What does Yeshayo say? We say it every day. Kadosh, 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 Hashem Tzavakos. Molo cholaretz kavodo. The world is filled, not just the world, the universe is filled with his glory. So that actually means Hashem exists in Timbuktu or Monterey, California, as much as he exists in the Beis HaMikdash. Hashem is everywhere. And yet, Judaism certainly has a, a concept of Kedushat Makam. Right, Eretz Yisrael is holier than the rest of the world. Yerushalayim is holier than the base than uh, Eretz Yisrael. Then you have the Harabayas, and then you have the uh, the Azara. Then you have the Heichel. Then you have the Kodesh Hakdashim. We say God is more there. That's where the Shechina is. What do you mean? The Shechina is here, right? The Shechina is everywhere. So the short answer would be that the reality of God's presence transcends time and place, space. God is not limited to time and God is not limited to space. But the capacity of my soul to receive his illumination is very much affected by the situation that I'm in. An example would be a cell phone, right? There are, zo there are zones that you can receive calls and then there are dead zones. So Hashem is equally present in California and the Temple Mount but my capacity to receive Hashem's light is much greater in certain places. And therefore, the notion of Shekhinah is the resting of God's presence in a manner that the human soul is able to receive that light. And that means that the person can be liberated from blockages and impediments and the like. And when there is a Beis HaMikdash, Especially, there is nevuah, meaning to say, the hashpa'a, the influence, the divine shefa, can be received. So I become more of a makabel, meaning the only thing that changes is not the mahus. Mahus is essence. It's not the essence of God. But the shinoi is mitzad hamakablim. The shinoi is on the, from the perspective of the receiver, not the, not the giver. Now in Kabbalah, as you know, Shekhinah is also called Malchus. And uh, in a sense, Malchus unifies with the upper levels of the God, and that is the source of blessing into the world. So, but that kind of goes back to what I said. It's not that God is here and not there, but rather from here is the source of blessing that flows into the entire world. Yeah. Uh, Two-part question. Part one is, why is it prohibited for Kohanim these days to become um, uh, connected to, to to May Mace if we're all May Mace in many ways? And part two, basically, hospitals are saying shy, except like that they have a sort of Kohanim. So, what are the halachic parameters for Kohanim going inside to visit family members? Like, they don't need to have a halachic medical operations, but they need to visit family members that they might need their emotional support. What are the yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are, uh, these are some uh, complicated questions. We know Kohanim are not allowed to come in contact with the dead. They're not allowed to become Tame unless it's uh, for designated relatives, father, mother, uh, wife, brother, sister, son, daughter. Uh, other than Kravim, there's an Isra de Arisa of Tumas Kohen. A Kohen cannot become Tame Lames, and that includes whether he touches a dead body or he moves or carries a dead body or... The most common problem is he's under an OL, he's under a roof, which can even be a tree, that covers both him and the, and the mace. 
Now the problem is the following. The problem is a very good question. And that is, every person today, is every Jew at least, is assumed to be Tame. Because if you ever were in a cemetery and you became Tame, you can only become purified through the ashes of the Paraduma, which we don't have today. So even if, you know, the last time you were in a cemetery was 50 years ago, you are Tame until you have Paraduma. So the problem is, if everybody is Tame already, then is there an Avera to go into a cemetery, for a Kohen to go into a cemetery if he's already Tame? Once you're Tame, you can't become more Tame. So is there an Avera? So the emesis, the emesis, the Ravid Shita is exactly your question. The Shita Sharavid is, there is no Iser for a Tame Kohen to become Tame because he's not making himself Tame, he's already Tame. So according to the Ravid, a Kohen today is allowed to go, the Ravid's mamish, can go into a cemetery. Exactly right. However, however, I need to be very emphatic, uh, the halacha is not like the Ravid. And we do say that it's usher, although we sometimes use the Ravid if you have other reasons to be makel. They'll use the Ravid as well. And we take the position that um, even to be mosif, even to add a tuma on a tuma is still usher. And part of that simply is because you're prolonging the period, meaning when I become tame, I'm tame for seven days. And at least theoretically, when there's a for para, I could get out of it after seven days. When I become tame a day later, I added a day. So being maisif tumal tumase is going to be an issue diaraisa. So practically speaking, the halacha lemaisa is a Kohen is not allowed to become tame. Now this creates enormous problems, fascinating halakhic problems, uh, which, you know, um, the way Tumah works is that if you have an airplane and the airplane flies over at least a Jewish cemetery, the Tumah of a Kever is like a guided missile. It goes straight up. <laughs> the plane flies over it, the Tumah goes up, penetrates the plane makes the Kohen tummy. So in El Al flight plans, they have to bedafka, arrange the flight, if there are Kohanim, so it does not go over cemeteries. Now, do they always keep to this? I don't know. But Kohanim uh, will insist on it, and hopefully they'll try to accommodate them. Um, and now, I saw a picture once of, of a guy that was sitting in a big plastic bag, a garbage bag, transparent garbage bag, uh, because that, that's considered a blocker. So even if the tumor goes in, he's blocked, the bag blocks him. To me, the funniest part of it, and I love this, is there's a guy sitting next to him just reading the, new, just reading the newspaper. Like nothing is going, <laughs> you know, like it's not even strange. I'm just reading the paper, the guy's sitting next to me in a, in a garbage bag. But okay, so that's one solution. Now, there's another problem as well, and that is when the flights carry dead bodies. You know, a lot of flights. Now these are mainly from, from New York, from Chutz Laaretz to Eretz Israel, because a lot of people who die in Chutz Laaretz want to be buried here. So El Al or other airlines will carry, uh, will carry corpses uh, in the baggage hold. And uh, the, the problem once again is the tumor goes up, penetrates into the cabin, and then even if the coin is not sitting above where the coffin is, but it's nispashet because of the OL, because of the roof of the, of the airplane. And that's also a problem. Again, uh, there are different ways out for that. But uh, El Al obviously does not know ahead of time if it'll be carrying a body. They know basically six hours before flight. Uh, they have to be notified. So they have special rules that Kohanim can get refunds. Uh, again, uh, with all of the criticism of El Al, but they do have to accommodate Kohanim, so if you can't, if you're a Kohen and you can't go on your flight because there is a, uh, a dead body that's going on the flight and you don't feel like using the garbage bag, they don't make you do that, do that. so uh, you can get a refund and a rescheduling and, and, and other things without, without penalty. Now, your particular question is about hospitals. Now, hospitals is, again, a, a similar type of problem. Uh, in hospitals, unfortunately, people die. And uh, what can happen basically is that even if somebody dies in a room, the tumor could spread across the hallway and enter the other, the other rooms. So
So potentially, a Cohen, any Cohen who enters really any part of the hospital might theoretically be vulnerable. Now, if the Cohen himself needs a, an operation, so he'd be, he'd be allowed to go in because potentially there's pikuach nefesh issues. But can a Cohen go into a hospital to, um, to just visit somebody? But Pashtus, he could not. If there's a real chashash of Tumas Meis, he would not be able to enter. But the way the religious hospitals are configured, uh, Shari Tzedek and the like, they have a system of double doors uh, from the morgue. And that means to say there will always be, you know, even when doors are open, there will be another set of doors that are closed. And therefore, the doors do block the tuma. The problem would only be if you didn't have double doors, the doors are open, the tuma kind of escapes. This way, the tuma never, never escapes. So they worked out the system. It's not, not a simple thing. Now, let me point out that the Iser, at least B'Shas HaTchak, of being in an Oel HaMais is only when the corpses are, are Jewish corpses. If they're non-Jewish corpses, even though if you touch them, you become Tameh, but the notion of the tuma spreading may not apply. And therefore, for hospital visits and the like, uh, a Kohen could be so mech that most of the people in the hospital are non-Jews, and I'm, I'm not mechuyev to assume that a Jew is going to die during my visit. So that might be a heter in Chutz Laretz. So in Chutz Laretz, you have a heter of Rov. In Eretz Yisrael, the Rov may not work, but uh, you have the double doors, and that's gonna, going to help. Uh, uh, yeah. Why is, if, if the double doors are okay, why on a plane? I, I mean, the, the corpses would be excited on First class, or you know, or wherever it's, it's in a separate. Chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pro okay. The problem is this. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this is really complicated. You know, one of the most complicated masechtos in shas is maseches oalos. Maseches oalos are eighteen prokim of mishnayos. There's no gemara on it that deal with the laws of tumas meis. And just to give as sim the simplest answer as I can, the double doors block horizontal expansion of tuma but they don't block vertical expansion of tumor. Meaning to say, if I have a mace in this room and I have closed doors and I'm in this room, the doors will block the tumor from moving horizontally. But if there's a mace under me, even if there's a solid floor, in many, many cases, the tumor will still rise up. So essentially, the double doors is dealing with a horizontal problem. And uh, the problem of the airplane is a vertical, a vertical problem. Yeah. But in the oh. first class might be, a, might be a solution, actually. Well, like a curtain between them uh, yeah, yeah, that might be so. That, that, that might be so, but the curtain has, the curtain has to be closed. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. Um, what you were saying before about how not all the Tarsh Kitsav is completely known, or it was not completely given back down. So Tarsh about Pat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if so, let's say after the Gemara, just to make it more simple, if we have a scientific, scientifically proven item, not like theoretical, such as like atoms can be split, that's such as what? Uh, atoms can be split, or anything yeah. like that, uh -huh. would that be able to disprove a regime? Yeah, so this is a very fascinating question, uh, and that is uh, the impact of science on Chazal. There are statements, yeah, you say Rishon, but I, I'll take it even further. What a Hanoim and Amoraim even, right? You know? Maybe you'll say it's Mokriyim, we accept it. Okay, Mokriyim. okay. Well, okay, okay, let me, let, let me answer your question directly. With respect to Arishan, I think it's a Dever Pasha that it could. I, 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 I don't even think that's much of a Shaila, actually. Uh, you get into much more questionable when, you're, when you, when you want to use a scientific finding to undermine uh, a, a ruling of Chazal. That is where you get into a very, very serious debate. Um, the outstanding example, the famous example, is killing a, light, a louse on Shabbos. Uh, the Gemara says that you're allowed to kill lice on Shabbos because the Easter of killing is only animals that reproduce sexually by Zohar and Nekeva. And lice do not, this is what the Gemara says, do not produ reproduce sexually they produce by decaying of matter. This was called spontaneous generation. And Mimela, there is no Iser of Nitilas Nishama. And indeed, this was the common belief. The belief in the ancient world was 
that life could be produced by the decaying of matter, that a lot of insects and a lot of bugs and worms were produced by decay, because after all, I mean, this is what they saw. They saw decaying bodies of animals and they saw worms there. So the logical understanding was that somehow the decay of the body produced all of these worms. Now, when the microscope was invented and they were able to look at these things under magnification and the like, they saw that uh, basically spontaneous generation was disproven scientifically and all life only comes from life, meaning even lice have a Mr. and Mrs. Louse involved, even though it may be almost microscopic, and uh, therefore there's no spontaneous generation. So the question becomes, well, wait a second here. See, it's one thing, if Chazal were machmir, this is why this is so problematical, and the science is wrong, because we could still say, well, we're stuck with their chumrah, this was their gezeira, this was their takana. But this is a different type of case. This is a case where we're actually maturing what would be an Isra de Orisa based on an erroneous scientific premise. So practically, now that I know that lice sexually produce, am I allowed to kill a louse? Can I follow the ruling of the Gemara or not? So this is a big machlokas, a big machlokas. Uh, there's a Sefer Pachad Yitzchak, which is not the Rav Huttner, which is the more famous Pachad Yitzchak. This is an earlier Pachad Yitzchak from the uh, 17th century, written by Rav Yitzchak Lapranti. It was an early encyclopedia of Talmud. And this was around the time of the microscope, where he says, it's a Dover Pashat, that if Chazal's scientific predicate is wrong, the halacha changes. The halacha changes, because Chazal based it on a certain assumption, the assumption was incorrect, the halacha changes. Rev Dessler writes about this, and he brings all sorts of other makoros, that the halacha does not change, even if the science changes. And he goes through a mystical theory that Hashem guides the chachamim to the right conclusions, even if they're using reasons that turn out to be factually incorrect. And therefore, the halacha has its own internal momentum. It's almost a ruach hakodesh idea of halacha, and Hashem has his own reasons. Uh, another approach that's given is halacha is not based on objective reality. Halacha is based on perceived reality. Just like, for example, I'm allowed to drink water even though there's undoubtedly microscopic insects in this water, but I don't see them, so mamela, there's no iser. So too, when Chazal say that lice do not produce sexually, they did not mean objectively that's the fact, but since perceptually I don't see it, so halachically it's ke'ilu they don't produce. In other words, halacha looks at perceived reality, and perceived reality is based on the naked eye. Which makes a lot of sense, because the Torah was given for all generations. So it can't be, the argument goes, that the halachic isurim change based on technology it has to be constant. So if 200 years ago they were allowed to do something, then we're allowed to do it. Right? That's the argument. Some make the opposite argument, that they're allowed to do it because they didn't have the technology. Okay, so this is a huge, huge issue, the impact of science and halacha. Uh, but with respect to a rishain, I would say for sure, for sure, uh, you could be cholik on a rishain based on the science. But you've got to be sure that you understand what the Rishon is saying. But sometimes you might think the Rishon is basing something on science, he might be basing it on something else. So you got to be very, very sure and very confident. But I don't see any principle that you would be bound by the erroneous scientific conclusions. It's only in the Gemara that we have this problem. By the way, let me just point out that all of this is going back to a Messira that is as old as Rav Haigon, one of the greatest of the Gaon, maybe the greatest of the Gaonim that when Chazal speak about science, they are not speaking as the Balei Messira of Teresh Abal Peh. They are speaking as knowing the, the best science of their time, and therefore it's entirely possible for that science to be erroneous. Meaning, you're not an Apikaris if you say Chazal's scientific statements are inaccurate. Yeah? If that's true, then why is Teshuvah that all the killing worked back when they invented it. 
every halacha says that they're not. Well, again, let me point out, you know, the Gemara gives many, many pages of refuas, right? The things you do for different illnesses. The Rambam in Hilchasteus has two chapters devoted to health and diet. And the Rambam gives his own medical advice. And the Rambam does not bring those refuas. So, it is generally understood that the Rambam is disagreeing with what Tosas' position, and that the Rambam's position is that these were recommendations based on the science and nutritional knowledge of the time, and that is subject to change. And that's why the same way the Rambam could be chaylik on the Gemara, we could be chaylik on the Rambam. Although Lamaisa, the Rambam's advice is still very, very good. In fact, uh, there are diet books today. Huh? No, so, 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 so many Achrayim follow, follow this approach in the Rambam. They, they say this. Now, others say that the Refuas are based on Kabbalah. They're not scientific to begin with. And therefore, they're based on mystical ideas. And uh, the Marshal says, we don't really know how the mystical processes work, so we shouldn't use them. But he's mighty that they remain valid, but not necessarily on scientific grounds. So it, it's a very, it's a very uh, complicated uh, issue, indeed. Uh, the notion of, because, I mean, here's the problem where Kina encapsulates the problem. On one hand, the scientific statements of Chazal are not authoritative. That's one, one, one extreme. On the other hand, the halachic statements of Chazal are authoritative. That's the other extreme. Problem, what if you have a halachic statement that's predicated on science? Do I say it's authoritative because it's halacha? Or do I say it's not authoritative because it's a halacha based on science? Meaning, there are pure scientific statements and there are pure halachic statements. But kina is a hybrid scientific halachic statement. Yeah? Um, I know this is like an, could be like a complicated halachic discussion. But yeah. Can you explain what the halachic dateline is? And, uh, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. And, what, and the history of like its discussion? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the notion of international dateline, kafa tarikh in Hebrew, uh, is something that was recognized uh, all the way back, well, it's Chazal, but, 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 but spoken about explicitly as early as the Baal HaMaor, Rav Zerachi HaLevi, uh, who lived um, in the, uh, uh, the 1100s, right? So Ari Shainim knew about this. And the necessity for some type of international dateline is uh, an automatic consequence of the Earth being round and the rotation of the Earth, right? The Earth rotates. The sun rises in the east and the sun sets in the west, but really it's not the sun that's moving, it's the Earth that's rotating. In fact, the Earth is rotating actually from west to east, and that's why the sun looks like it's moving from east to west. Now, the problem, therefore, is when you move east, the day gets later and later and later, right? The sun rises in Israel before it rises in New York, right? So when you go east, later, 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 later. When you go west, earlier, 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 earlier. At some point, though, in a circle, the two ends meet. So when does later become earlier? Right? So the date line is the idea that at some point there will be a 24-hour difference, meaning one place is getting earlier, earlier, earlier to be the beginning of the last day, and the other will be 24 hours later, the beginning of the next day. And literally, one side of the line will be 24 hours later than the other side of the line. The notion that there has to be such a line was recognized, as I say, by the Balamor and was recognized by the Kuzari. Kuzari was even earlier than the Balamor. So the notion of a date line is absolutely muhrach because that is the nature of time. Time changes with the rising of the sun. Now the problem is, though, you have to have a date line, but there's no particular place you need to draw it. You could draw it anywhere. Meaning, you're just defining how far it is east, when, you know, how far east is east, and how far west is west. 
right? Whatever is west of a certain point, time will be earlier. Whatever is east of a certain point, time will be later. At some point, the later becomes the earlier, right? So you have to have that, otherwise it makes no sense, but it could be anywhere. So where does halacha draw the date line? Now, the secular international date line is really a matter of convenience, and um, I think it only dates to the middle of the 1800s, it's supposed to be in the middle of the Pacific Ocean where like, nothing's around there except some islands. It was drawn, frankly, just to minimize the inconvenience and the like. Halakhically, one would assume that that's not so relevant. So the big machlokas, uh, there's a huge, huge machlokas, what the halakhic date like. In fact, by the way, uh, not that Gedolim care about fame, but this is what made the Chazonish famous, right? The Chazonish was an anonymous Avreich who just sat and learned all day and wrote Svarim. He was not well known. What made the Chazanish world famous was his stance on the international date line when the Mir Yeshiva was in Shanghai in Japan, uh, not Japan, but Shanghai, uh, because they had to know when they would observe Yom Kippur and when they would observe Shabbos. The Chazanish, based on the Kuzari and the Balhamor, takes the position that uh, East only goes six hours from Yerushalayim, meaning it's six hours to the East, 18 hours to the West. That would mean the following. That would mean once you get to China and Japan, it is halachically a day earlier, a day earlier. In other words, You've crossed the date line halachically, even though you have not crossed the date line there, which means practically, according to the Chazanish, when it is Saturday in Japan, it actually is Friday. And when it is Sunday in Japan, that is when it's Shabbos. In other words, the Chazanish has a date line that is crossed much earlier. And therefore, according to the Chazanish, when you are in China, or Japan, or part of Australia, you must observe Shabbos on Sunday, Saturday night, and Shabbos. And the Chazanish was so sure of this psaq that he even told them the Gabe Yom Kippur. He says, you can eat, you can eat on the day that people think is Yom Kippur, because your Yom Kippur is the day after. Other poskim differ, and for various reasons, they actually say that the date line is um, not six hours, but it's 12 hours from Jerusalem, which actually makes it approximately the Pacific point. And therefore, the date line is much further east, and therefore, as a result, China is still within the same date uh, as Yerushalayim. And therefore, this was a huge machlokas. Do you keep Shabbos on Saturday, or do you keep Shabbos on Sunday? And there are many, many shitas. Once you get into this, it's so technical because then there's all sorts of little islands. Do you throw them on different sides of the date line? So la halacha, la halacha, more or less, you know, you need to talk to a rabbi, you need to get a map. The Star K produced a very excellent map in Baltimore of all the different date line configurations. La halacha, though, generally speaking, in China uh, and in Japan, if you're coming from Israel, in Hawaii, if you're coming from the U.S., you keep Shabbos on the day that is Saturday in those places. But some people are machmer, like the Chazanish, to keep two days of Shabbos, but they're only machmer on Malachos to Oraisa and not to Rabbanan, which means on Saturday they will keep a complete Shabbos. On Sunday, they will refrain from malachos to oraisa, but they will put on tefillin and daven a tefillah scho. Not everybody does that. And most Rabbi Salvation is going to shame. That's correct. Most people do not do this. I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to give you a, a psaac that you should do it, uh, but some people do this. Some people will keep a chazaynish dateline l'chumra on the second, on the second Shabbos. But it's very, again, this is, again, a very complicated question, and uh, <laughs> you can get encyclopedic uh, smarim that discuss this issue. Yeah. Um, uh, in the context of the writing of the Mishnah, 
write down the oral code. Uh, what is the role of the Midrash in tradition? Uh, is the Midrash authority equivalent to the Midrash authority? Is the Midrash authority equivalent to the Mishnah authority? Yeah, yeah, this is a very, uh, very excellent question. Uh, we talk about Mishnah, we talk about Gemara, but what about the whole genre that are called Medrash? Medrash Rabbah, Medrash Tanchuma, uh, and, and the like. Now, the people in those Midrashim are the same people in the Gemara, Tanoim and Amoraim. Uh, the question is, what is the particular halachic status of, of Midrash? So, the Ramban writes, the Ramban actually says that Midrashim are not of the same authority as the halachic statements of, of the Gemara. They represent the individual interpretations of great Chachamim. In fact, the Ramban calls it similar, similar, similar to a drasha that a rabbi would make today. Of course, these are much, much greater than we are. I mean, there's no question about it, but it's a drasha. The rabbis had their drashas, had their interpretations, had their thoughts, and we should pay attention to it because these are great, great tzaddikim and tomerei chachamim, but they were not part of the Messiah that was given to Moshe at Sinai. This is what the Ramban says. Uh, some people say the Ramban didn't mean that. There's a little bit of an ambiguity. But the Pashtas, the Ramban, and much later, Rav Shem Hirsch, says that the Midrashim are not part of the Mesorah. Maharal seems to differ. Maharal says like this. This is a little different. The Maharal says Midrashim are really metaphors for very deep spiritual ideas. The spiritual ideas were given to Moshe B'Sinai, but the particular form that they took is the invention of the speaker. In other words, this is an interesting hybrid. So when it gives you a story, it gives you a mashal, that was not given to Moshe B'Sinai. But the idea of that mashal was. So you could say the Chachamim chose the form, but Hashem dictated the substance. Right? That's how you would look at, at the Midrashim. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the first question is, if there is foreign currency in a charity box, can you take out the foreign currency and give it uh, to somebody who will take it to that country? Yeah, the answer is almost certainly not, because, because uh, it was put in a charity box that will be distributed to Aniyam in Eretz Yisrael, who will find some way to change the money. So you don't have the right to divert money that would go to the poor of one locality and give it to another locality. So I don't see any heter at all for you to take that. Now, can you make change? So the halacha is, uh, we're, we're no, although there's some discussion in the Gemara, whether it's proper because of marasai, and people don't know that you're honest, you know, you might uh, take out more than you're putting in. But the halacha, the minog is, that as long as uh, you resolve any doubts in favor of tzedakah, meaning you use the highest exchange rate uh, that's, uh, of that time, uh, you are permitted to do that. that. That much you are allowed to do. Yeah. Is there a real difference between hashgacha and halacha? Because isn't it inevitable that if a hashgacha is print, like hashgacha is principle usually in forms on a whole life, so that usually has like hundreds of halachic implications. Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Hashgacha. Hashgacha is my philosophy, my outlook, my theology. Halacha is how do I behave. So there are those who take the position that there's no such thing as a psak halacha on hashkafa, meaning like this. Let's imagine there's a debate, as there is a debate. Does Judaism endorse or does Judaism tolerate a belief in evolution? Some people say no, some people say yes. Most gedolim say no, other people say yes. So some people say, well, you can believe what you want because uh, this is a hashkafa question. They say there's no definitive halacha on hashkafa, 
And as long as I follow the halachos of the Shulchan Aruch and the Pesach of Gedolim, I have freedom of belief on at least contested issues. Meaning, if there's no makor that supports me, maybe not. So that's view number one. View number two is, there is no, again, I'm just, is exactly what you said, there is no such thing as a hashkafa question that doesn't have a halachic implication. For example, uh, if I maintain that evolution is a not kosher belief, then the one who maintains such a belief is an apikoris, and his wine is going to be usher. If he touches it, you know, not mavushal. So memela, there's hilchos apikorsis. Who's an apikoris? That is a pure halachic matter. This came up a lot uh, with, again, uh, Rabbi Slifkin. Again, I don't want to rehash uh, history. If you don't know about it, it's probably better that you don't know about it. But Rabbi Slifkin is a, a person who was a, you know, a, a lamdan, a, a Talmud Chacham, I, I think. And he wrote uh, various books on Judaism and science. And uh, those books were very, very controversial. Uh, he did quote uh, Rishainim for everything. Uh, so he, he would, it was sourced. But it was thought by some people that this was not the accepted view of Torah authorities in recent centuries, and therefore it was said to be apicorsis, you shouldn't read the books. Uh, and he, his claim was, well, I have Makoros from Rav Haigon, Rav Avram ben Arambam, and part of the answer was, they could believe it, but you can't. Meaning they could espouse ideas because there was not a psak halacha then, once there's a psak halacha, you can no longer believe certain things. So some people thought that was ridiculous because if they were allowed to believe something is true, then how, how do you take away my ability to believe that something is true? So Rabbi Yashif said, there's a psak halacha on hashkafa, just like there's a psak halacha on halacha. Meaning to say, at, at a certain point in Jewish history, you were permitted to believe certain things. After that point, you're not allowed to believe in those things. And that's a halacha. That the halacha of what is the definition of an apikoris and the like. So that was Rabbi Yasha's position, that all hashkafic questions are ultimately going to be halachic uh, matters. Uh, but there are people who argue. There are people that say it's not shaykh to aser freedom of thought in hashkafa if there are sources in Chazal or Rishonim that would support it. What about like less, more overarching, like less specific issues? Let's say if you asked a, a Rav in a Sabra community about X, X issue that, that his politics may inform on the halacha, like how does that work? You know, we, we run into um, a real, real, real problem of circularity. Uh, but by that I mean to say, you know, you're asking me a question, um, are these hashkafic policy issues of Zionism or whatever it is, do they become halachic? Are they halachic issues or not? Well, you know, it depends who you ask, meaning to say, if you ask Satmer, is belief in Zionism a halachic prohibition, they'll say yes. Uh, if you ask someone who's not Satmir, they'll say no. Uh, so, so in a sense, we don't have anybody outside of the protagonists who will give you an objective, an objective answer. But I think in the Litvish Torah world, at least, if I could generalize, I, I believe that there was a pretty sharp division between Hashkaf and Halacha. I, I think it was understood in the relative tolerance that existed in the Olam HaShul Torah that there can be different views on a lot of things. Views on the army, views on Yisachar Zavulin, views on secular studies, even views on the role of women in certain parameters, views of Zionism. And it was understood that these are different deus in Klal Yisrael. And remember, I'll give you an analogy. Just as the Sanhedrin didn't want to paskin on certain issues, there was a notion in, in the Litvish Torah world that we're not going to paskin. So that's not so much saying it's not a halachic issue, but rather the poskim didn't want to make it a definitive halachic issue, and they left it to individual conscience or individual consultation with your das Torah, whatever, whatever that would be. So I think that was the mahalach. The mahalach in the Litvish world, uh, until recently, Eretz Yisrael changed a lot of things, because in Eretz Yisrael, everything becomes a halachic determination. But until uh, recently, there was a great deal of ideas that certain things each person has to decide for himself. Yeah. Here's another sentence. 
We learn that if a prophet arises and attempts to prove his veracity through magic, miracles, and wonders, we do not believe him based on that. So, in parts of Shemot, why would Moshe be given the three signs with which to prove to the Jews that he is carrying the word of Hashem? Couldn't this easily confuse later generations into reasoning that if Hashem says that these miracles were good enough to prove Moshe, then similar feats are good enough to prove any other prophet? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, the Rambam writes, uh, and the Torah really writes, that uh, even if a Navi you know, uh, does magic and all sorts of things, uh, if he tries to change the Torah, he's a Navi Sheker, because we don't consider magic or the appearance of magic to be proof of truth, and uh, therefore it doesn't change anything. And yet, <laughs> that's exactly how Moshe Rabbeinu initially convinced the Jewish people and Pyro to listen to him by these various things that he did. So the technical answer I'm going to give you, but I'm not sure if it's a total answer, is that the rule that we don't look at Kisha, if we don't look at magic, is literally a post-Matan Torah rule. Meaning to say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu established a parameter that Matan Torah is the greatest and highest and deepest revelation that will ever occur. And B'nai Yisrael sensed that. That's the phrase, V'gam b'cha yaminu li'olam. Hashem said to, B'nai Yisrael, uh, said to Moshe Rabbeinu, they will believe in you forever and ever. So as a consequence of Har Sinai, any subsequent revelation, no matter how dramatic it is, can never supersede what occurred at, as the Rambam's Lashon, Hamaymed Hanichbat, that awesome assembly. So as a result, therefore, you can't ask me Akasha about what Moshe Rabbeinu did before Matan Torah, because before Matan Torah, there was no definitive parameter uh, of revelation that was established. So as a result, you know, there is some probability given uh, to ki uh, the powers of, 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 I don't want to call it Kisha, if it wasn't Kisha, but the powers of Moshe Rabbeinu changing the Teva in various ways. So the whole rule about not believing in Osos is really a post Matan Torah phenomenon because as the Rambam said, we experienced with our own eyes, we actually saw the Gile Yashchina. And therefore that's something very different than just doing miracles that could be optical illusions or hypnosis and the like. Einenu ro velozor. We saw the re whatever that means even, we saw the revelation of God, right? So that would be the, the difference, yeah. Um, so the rabbi has indicated previously that a key reason why Haredi uh, yeshiva students or Haredi in general should be exempt from army service is that there was sufficient manpower without them. Now there is a shortfall as the army is extending the amount of time drafted soldiers need to serve and increasing the age limit for reservists. Is it no longer appropriate to have such a blanket exemption? And if I could uh, expand the question uh, to bring it out of just like right now in this current moment, <coughs> you say like, like, oh, and theoretically there would be a time when Haredi would serve, but we can always cope in the Chilonim and the, the uh, Dati Lumi, so we can say, oh, just serve 10 years, 20 years, uh, reserve up to 80 years old. And like, uh, yeah. <laughs> pushing it so that, Yep. Like never have to yep. Like put, put in those 80 years old and you solve the manpower shortage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to tell you that um, this question is bothering a lot of people. I mean, this, this must be the, um, for me, just me, the 10th uh, person through email or whatever it is that, that brought up uh, this issue. It's a very, very painful issue because for many, many years, one of the stock arguments that Haredim were able to make is, hey, if there would be a real state of emergency, uh, mitzvah, there's no other way to fight the enemy, then of course we would join Melchemes Mitzvah. But you know, that's not the situation. There are plenty of people in the army. And indeed, uh, there were many years where people made the argument, Israel doesn't, need, doesn't even need a draft. Israel could go with the all-volunteer army and there are plenty of people. So as a result, it's a mitzvah that can be done by other people. So what's our hetra to be mavatal Torah or even to put ourselves in a bad environment, right? That was a standard argument that was made. Meaning, now, there were those who say we're exempt legamri, but, 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 but 
the more moderate form of the argument is, yes, we're chayev in national defense, but it's a mitzvah that can be done by others because there's no manpower shortage, and therefore we should not go away from our learning. That was indeed, I mean, I've said, I've said it, you know, I've said it myself, but, but you know, I didn't invent that argument. That was a standard argument uh, that has been used a lot. Uh, the problem is the argument is under stress right now because, you know, uh, leaves are being canceled. Uh, there is a shortage that we don't have enough people to give people normal furloughs and, 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 and the like. So the question is, what do you mean? A sh Again, it's exactly your question. A shortage. Well, theoretically, you know, you could just cancel all vacations and let the Dati Liumi or the Chilonim uh, fight or even, uh, even raise the age of, of military, compulsory military service. At what point is there such a need for people to fight that indeed we should include the B'nai Torah or at least the Haredim? Again, again it's... it's People, 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 there are two different issues here. One is full-time yeshiva students. The other is Haredim. I mean, not, you know, not every Haredi is in full-time yeshiva. You know, but, but whatever. For our purposes, these are two different questions, actually. But we'll just collapse them into, into one situation. Um, it's a very, very tough question. It is a very tough question. I, I, you know, it, it all depends. I, I agree with you. We're not going to uh, put in the 80-year-olds. But the question is, if there are people who are able-bodied and in good health, and a certain amount of inconvenience is going to be added to them, I think we would still make the argument, but at some point it's going to become excessive. At some point, you're going to hit a, a, a breaking point. And I think what's going on is, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of old, ex uh, old assumptions are going to be re-examined. Uh, it's, it's very, very fascinating. Uh, a lot of things are changing because of the stresses of this very difficult situation that we're in. And I think, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking not as a, a posik or a rav, I'm speaking just as a journalist, so to speak. I think you're going to see more and more uh, B'nai Torah uh, joining the army in one way or the other. Uh, whether it'll be openly encouraged or tacitly encouraged, or at least not complained about. We've already seen a few thousand people join the army. I think, I think it's going to be more. And I think people are going to feel that they have to do this, that, that, that simply they have to contribute towards the pikuach nefesh of, of Am Yisrael in what is a milchemes mitzvah. So, and, and there'll be other changes as well. I mean, there are changes in terms of Parnassah, Rav Moshe Hillel Hirsch, who is uh, this, actually the senior Rosh Hashiva in Eretz Yisrael right now. He's the Rosh Hashiva of the Slabodka Yeshiva in Bnei Brak. He happens to be American, but he's been here for, forever. Um, he recently made a speech, and right next to him was Rav Dov Landau, who was another very senior Rosh Hashiva, Talmud of the Chazanish, in which he said, it's time to recognize that we need, that, that B'nai terrorists sometimes have to go into the working pla uh, place and support their families, and they should be regarded as B'nai Torah, and we have to create a framework for them to flourish. Now, this may sound very obvious to you. you know, <laughs> Gee, you know, what's going on? <laughs> you know, big deal. Uh, but the truth is, in Eretz Yisrael, it actually is a big deal, uh, because it is one of the rare times that there was an open acknowledgement that there may be a need to foster and encourage Parnassa. Again, as I say, for an American, this sounds like, you know, hey, this is like, you know, 200 years old, whatever it is, but, but it's actually a, an innovation. So what's happening is, I, I know I'm not answering your question directly, uh, but, but what's happening is that, uh, like Bob Dylan says, the times, they are a changing, uh, and um, a lot of things are going to change. And I, and I think this issue of manpower shortage is a real issue that people are not willing to accept anymore. Uh, and at some point, uh, something is going to come to a head. Yeah? Um, a lot of times in capitalist terminology, there's an idea of this, like one sphere of being misavik uh, or miyakiva. Yeah, yichudim. Exactly, yeah. It's becoming a lot in public work, especially. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, Kabbalah is Kabbalah, and it's very, very complicated, and I don't want to 
make believe that I, I'm some expert in Kabbalah. I'm definitely not. Uh, but there are two statements about Kabbalah. One statement is, if you don't believe in Kabbalah, you're an apikoris. And there's another statement that says, if you do believe in Kabbalah, you're an apikoris. That there are ideas in mainstream Kabbalah that, frankly, the Rambam might regard as kfira gemura. Because Kabbalah talks about God being divided or diffused in ten spheros. And it talks about a need to unify the spheros to bring them together. What, what's going on? God, there's only one God. One, one, one. There are not different parts that have to be brought together. Right? So there's a real, real problem with that. So uh, all the Mukubalim say, this is only a marshal. It's not meant to be literal. It is a marshal. Okay. A marshal for what? I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> it's a marshal for something. Uh, the problem is that very, very few Sfarim ever talk about the nimshal. They only talk about the, they only talk about the marshal, that it alludes to something. But the basic idea is uh, based on a Pasuk in Eof, where Eof says, Mipsari Echazalaika, from my flesh I understand God. And that is somehow all of the ways human beings think, human beings act, is a mirror, is a reflection of processes that are happening within God. That's part of the implication of being B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God. We understand God, I mean, not fu fully, but to whatever little degree we can understand God, we understand God by analyzing human thought, human speech, human action, human processes. Now we know that because the physical world is a reflection of a spiritual reality, you see? So from the physical, we extrapolate to the spiritual. Now we know that the way life is created is by the union of a masculine and feminine element. And through that union, there is a life force. So Kabbalah sees, it's, a, really, it's very, very explicit, uh, that the sexual union itself is the paradigm for the processes that occur within HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that bring life and light in, and bracha into the world. And therefore, the notion of Yichudim means that within Hashem, there are masculine and feminine elements. And when there's a unification of them, that creates the Shefa. I mentioned before, the phrase in L'Shem Yichud, which is a Kabbalistic prayer, which, by the way, the Night of Yehuda said you're not allowed to say, because you, know, you don't understand it. But it says, L'Shem Yichud, Kudsha Berichu Ushechinted. What does that mean? I'm doing this mitzvah for the purpose of unifying HaKadosh Baruch Hu and His Shekhinah. What is HaKadosh Baruch Hu and His Shekhinah? HaKadosh Baruch Hu are the six Sviros and Shekhinah is the last one, Malchus, which is feminine. I'm doing it to unify and align the masculine element of God and the feminine element of God which will bring life into the, into the world. Now again, you understand the problem. I mean, the problem is a real problem. I mean, God is one. What are you talking about unifying? What is Yechudim? Yechudim implies separation. If I have to unify something, that means before I unify it, it's separated. But God is not separated, right? So, Kav Yocho, it's a marshal. <laughs> but it, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to say. I, I really can't say that much more. I mean, but that's uh, it is a real problem. Yeah. Um, does it does it does it halachically matter whether the menorah is arched or straight? Um, whether it's what? Whether it's ar arched branches or straight branches? Oh yeah 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 yeah. And also, um, why is it why is it discussed in the Gemara? And also, does just a more general sense does archaeology is it different than whether it's between, uh, yeah, just a very, very, yeah, just a very quick uh, background on this. Uh, in the base of Mikdash, of course, we had a menaira, and on the Arch of Titus, which actually portrays the Jews in chains carrying the menaira, the branches of the menaira are rounded, are curved, and uh, that is also the menaira of the State of Israel, based on the Arch of Titus. And yet, if you look at 
the Rambam, the Rambam's own drawing. The Rambam actually did his own drawings, and Chabad's menorah is based on the Rambam's drawing. These are straight, like diagonal poles uh, that come up. Uh, so the question is obviously, there's a machlokas here. Uh, halachically, does it make a difference? No, it does not. But both are going to be kosher. So that's not a halachic issue. Uh, the question would be, uh, should the Arch of Titus be treated? I mean, after all, the Arch of Titus is, was contemporary with the Chorban itself. Uh, on the other hand, the Romans did it. The Jews didn't make the Arch. Uh, should we regard the archaeological Arch of Titus as very definitive evidence? Isn't it just uh, Arch of yeah. Titus? Because they say like every coin they find in the ground also shows it. Okay, I, I guess it would be okay. Okay, I don't know. Okay, but that, the the menorah is rounded in all of those coins. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one would assume that archaeology should be relevant in this. Uh, it, in fact, a little bit of a kasha on the Rambam. What was the Rambam's bakor for that? In fact, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting thing. The Ramban came to Eretz Yisrael the, towards the end of his life. And the Ramban writes a fascinating thing that there was a machlokas Rashi and Tosvos. What is the silver weight of a half shekel coin? Based on interpreting Gemaras, how much silver is in a half shekel coin that you have to give to the base of Mikdash? So the Ramban says, of course, neither Rashi nor any of the Balitosis were ever in Eretz Yisrael. They, they didn't know firsthand, and they're just trying to figure it out by looking at the text. The Ramban says, I bought a half shekel coin from an Arab who sold me a half shekel coin, probably for a lot of money, and I cleaned it, and I weighed it, and I, it was very exact, I weighed it several times, and I saw that Rashi was correct. It was almost Ruach HaKadosh, that Rashi got it right, uh, even though Rashi never saw a half shekel coin or whatever. So it's a very interesting Ramban because you see that the Ramban was machria, a machlokas among the Rishainim based on archaeology, based on the coin that he found, right? So it would seem that that should have some credence on that. Uh, yeah? Wouldn't we then know the size of an Amma based on, uh, I mean, right there, it's an edge, so we can do it. We should know how big an Amma is because the Gemara describes how big we would make the place where we put the body and they still exist and that's when we can make yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good kasha. Ama, right? Uh, we have all sorts of machloksim. How big is an ama? Is an ama 18 inches? In modern, 24 inches. Uh, maybe a different size, 16 inches. Uh, all sorts of machloksim. And yet, we have uh, graves, kivarim of the Sanhedrin, catacombs. And uh, Chazal give dimensions for these graves in terms of amos. So we can just measure and see how big it is. At least it isn't smaller. Huh? At least it's not smaller. Right, right, right. Yeah, so at least it would be, right, right, so you're right, right. Um, I don't know, it's a good question. I, I, let me look into it a little bit. Meaning, I have to admit that many, many postkim do ignore archeology. span uh, But I think when they do, I think there's gonna be a question. And, and, and the point is, your question is even stronger because Ignoring a coin or something, you can always say, well, coins you know, are minted in different weights and they're not standardized and you can't prove anything. But here, if you're talking about the Gevarim of the Sanhedrin, presumably they're all the same and uh, they would do it right for them. Maybe they wouldn't do it right for uh, other people. So I think your question is even stronger, but Dafka, on that particular example, yeah. Ready feminism, yeah. And um, it's, it is very interesting. And, like, even, um, like, I guess, like, as I was, like, listening to you speak, well, I was, like, wondering, like, is this, I know, like, this is obviously a very general, like, general way of saying it, but is this, like, a good thing? You know, I, I don't want. I don't want to use the word crisis because I don't want to make it crisis. But you know, it is a little bit of a crisis, and that is the following: 
you have uh, economic necessity that's clashing with maybe the traditional role of a woman. Obviously, the traditional role of a woman was wife, mother, akera tabayas, spending time, full time with the children. And yet, when you have a system where the men are not getting regular jobs, and they're basically living on kolal checks, which are not enough to live on, and by definition, therefore, uh, the woman has to be the primary breadwinner, and for that they deserve much gratitude and credit. So by definition, uh, they're going to advance career-wise in ways that from a career level, which will be much more successful than their husbands. Again, I'm not demeaning the learning, I mean, but all I'm saying is don't get, they're going to make more money. And as a result, that has an internal momentum that can be very problematical. Meaning, in a worst case scenario, and again, I, I'm not suggesting that this happens all the time. It certainly does not happen all the time, and I'm not even saying a majority of the time. But in a worst case scenario, a worst case scenario, a woman might lose respect for her husband because we live in a society that sometimes looks at the one who makes more money as you know, the more significant person. And this can result in shalom bias problems. And this can result in losing respect for a husband. This can result in the husband himself being depressed if he is not the primary breadwinner in the family, which is what the ksuva envisions. So there are Haredi thinkers uh, that have identified this movement, uh, what you call Haredi feminism, although we wouldn't necessarily call it feminism, as kind of a danger to the Jewish, to the family, particularly with mothers spending less time with their children. So it is an issue to be concerned. But the question is, what do you do about it? Meaning to say the only way to redress it is by putting more Haredi men in the regular workforce. And even then, you sometimes need two incomes, but whatever it is. So it's like you try to achieve one goal at the cost of another goal. Maybe this indicates that the original setup, that men would work for Parnassa as the Ksuba requires, maybe that's the healthier way of raising a family. It might very well be the healthier way of raising the family. I think there's no doubt. I mean, when a person gets married, they sign, a, or they don't sign, but a Ksuba is signed by Adam. The ksuva says, the first line of the ksuva, I, I meaning husband, I will work and support my wife. That's what it says. Uh, in fact, that's what Rosh Hashiva say when they tell the Talmud, you got to go to work. They say, now it's time for you to fulfill your obligations under the ksuva. A kolal person has to recognize that if their wife agrees to let them learn in kolal, that is a gift, you know, for, maybe for good reasons, you know. That is a gift she is giving him. She is not obligated to agree to this. She has the right at any time to say, you are obligated to support me. And it seems that psychologically, that is actually a better way of ordering things. I, I don't want to get too uh, stereotypical, but you know, it is kind of the natural function of the man to want to support their family. This is a, a male thing, you know? And uh, when we go out of sync with, with nature, there are going to be problems. Okay. I'm going to get a lot of attacks on this one. Um, this will be an attack on both sides. It will be attack from the Kolo community, and it will be attack from the women, uh, female community. So it will get um, both, both ends. Um, that's what the Kutsky Rebbe said. When you walk in the middle of the highway, you get hit with traffic <laughs> <laughs> on both sides. Yeah? How typical is? Uh, oh, Ape Tlasa. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. Maybe I'm going to hold it over for next week. I'll just begin to answer it. Uh, this is a statement in the Gemara that says any derogatory statement that was already said in front of three is no longer Lashon Hare, can be repeated, because once three people hear about it, it's public and the whole world knows, uh, and therefore you're repeating things that are already known. So that would seem to be kind of a heter to say Lashon Hare once it's been said. Uh, the Chavitz Chaim has a long, the longest section in Sefer Chavitz Chaim is devoted to the Ape Tulasa, and he basically says it almost never applies today. Uh, but where it might apply is, I'll give you an example, and, and maybe next week maybe I'll talk about this more because it deserves a little more. The issue is that once something 
is in an extremely public forum, like something has been posted on the internet. And it is potentially accessible by millions and millions of people. That might be a situation of Abi Tulasa. So we wouldn't apply it to three people. We don't, uh, the Chavitz Chaim basically does that. But if something is widely, widely, widely publicized, uh, you can talk about it. But again, I'm not giving you a halacha, but I'm just saying that is potentially where Abi Tulasa would come up. Yeah? Um, so I was talking to a Karai uh, a few months ago. A Karai, right, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so again, uh, this also needs a little more analysis, but the Pashtus is that the lunar calendar was Nishadesh in Mitzrayim when Hashem told Moshe, HaChodesh Hazel Lachem Rosh Chadashim. So, uh, in other words, the moon. So as a result, in the, in the pre, so it's not, it's, it is pre-Matan Torah, but in the pre Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim situation, it could very well be that the solar calendar was indeed the norm, the normal way of computing time. So we were willing to accept that uh, the measurement of time changed uh, with Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Okay, maybe we'll stop here and uh, thank you. Have a good day. Uh